the usual. This All meeting is order. being recorded. Uh, so welcome to the Amherst Historical Commission public meeting on Wednesday, March 16th, 2022. My name is Jane Wald and as chair of the Amherst Historical Commission, I'm calling this meeting to order at 6.39 p.m. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting is being conducted by remote means. As no in-person attendance is permitted, every effort is being made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time uh, via technological means. Uh, in addition, this meeting is being recorded and minutes are being taken. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so in the following manner. Uh, go to the town's homepage on an internet browser, navigate to the town calendar. Uh, at the bottom of that page, click on the historical, committee, uh, historical commission meeting link. Zoom and telephone connections and the me meeting agenda can be found there. Uh, now for roll call attendance. So board members, as you hear your name called, please answer affirmatively or raise your raise your hand in the, raise your Zoom hand, either, <laughs> either way. Uh, uh, Patricia Aw. Present. Catherine Davis. Present. Uh, Robin Fordham. Present. Becky Lockwood. Present. Jan Marquardt. Uh, will be joining us as soon as you can. Um, Hetty Startup. Present. And Jane Wald, I'm present too. Um, opportunity for public comment will be provided during uh, the public comment period further down on the agenda uh, and, it, and perhaps at other appropriate times throughout the meeting. Uh, please be aware uh, the commission will take note of comments, but uh, will not necessarily respond to them during uh, public comment periods. Um, if you wish to make a comment, uh, please click the raise hand button when comment is solicited. Um, if you've joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your telephone. Um, when called upon, uh, Please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes and at the discretion of the commission chair. So the first item on our agenda is uh, to review and vote on the Jones Library historic preservation restriction, I think, pending whether the trustees of the library have done so today. Uh, but let me ask Ben to explain where we are in this process and um, uh, perhaps the, ch uh, the changes that have been made since we last looked at that agreement. Yeah, sure thing. Um, thanks, Jane. So the, um, I don't remember the, background is probably a few months ago, maybe in the, even going back to the fall that we saw the uh, previous iteration of the preservation restriction. And the at that time, the historical commission, you all voted to kind of like uh, conditionally approve the restriction pending um, some changes, you know, even including like the spelling of Jan's name and, <laughs> but also the, uh, there was some concerns raised about um, a clause about the insurance and the indemnity section of the um, restriction. And subsequently, there's been a host of meetings between town staff, the library trustees, the town's legal counsel, and the Massachusetts Historical Commission. And I think over the past few months, those issues have been ironed out. And ultimately, the you know, the, the final, you know, step was the Massachusetts Historical Commission um, approved of the, you know, final draft that you see here today of, of the restriction. And subsequently, actually, it was this morning that the Jones Library trustees uh, just, you know, coincidentally happened to be meeting the same day, and um, they voted to approve the restriction and, uh, you know, essentially accept the restriction. So, 
the the next step is for um, where we are now is the historical commission. You all to you know take a formal vote on the adoption of the preservation restriction. Um, that's Act One, and then uh, I guess over the next you know week or so, we can have folks uh, come into town hall and actually sign it in front of a notary. Um, is is kind of the the final step, and then uh, I think the the Massachusetts Historical Commission also needs to formally you know sign it with you know they've agreed over email it's in its final form. And then uh, it needs to be filed with at the uh, registry of deeds. So um, it's been a long process, um, and it's kind of at the uh, one yard line, if you will, um, with kind of just a few more steps to go to actually adopt it. But um, what's before you today has kind of been voted on by the Jones Library trustees and accepted. It's been you know conditionally approved by Massachusetts Historical Commission, and it just needs. Uh, a formal vote and signing by the commission members today. Do you want me to kind of go over the what the restriction does and doesn't do in general, or do we, you know, I kind of went over that last time, but I'm happy to give a summary. No, I, I uh, if I can see heads either nodding or shaking, no. I mean, I, I think we went over it pretty thoroughly last time. Um, so if um, perhaps if there are, you know, pages or, or items where you can point us to the significant changes that we really felt were not that needed to be that needed to be resolved elsewhere. Um, just to just for our information in this last um, yeah this last iteration of the consideration. Yeah, and now also, I mean, I definitely want to make sure Jan is here for when we actually vote. So, um, yeah, truth be told, the changes that were made about the insurance closet or the insurance clause and the indemnification clause, I, I wasn't super privy to those meetings. Um, I, I have a version that shows the track changes, but I, I um, I trusted that you know if the library trust it was it was more of an issue with the library trustees and if they felt comfortable adopting it and the, the language worked for them then um, I didn't think it was really the historical commissions um, you know under their purview necessarily um, so but in terms of the kind of substantive parts of the restriction um, here's the the home page the kind of title page. Um, it really, you know, I think it's worth noting that the there's kind of this distinction between the the property itself, which is literally like the, the the boundaries of the site for the Jones Library, the parcel itself. There's the building, which is defined here, you know, capital B building, and that really refers to the 1927-1928 like original structure, which we saw. Um, you know, we we saw a pretty in-depth uh, presentation about with the historic structures report. And then um, there's kind of the, you know, the, the, the uh, historic resources on the site. And so the, uh, where is that defined? Kind of the, the preservation values here is, is a defined term that refers to the, you know, architectural and historical and cultural values of the building and the property. Um, and so, um, with those kind of few terms in mind, I'm just going to kind of scroll through here a little bit. Um, so there's the purpose, you know, it's to assure that the features and characteristics that embody the architectural, historical, and cultural significance of the exterior of the building will be, will be forever retained and maintained substantially in their current condition. And to prevent any use or change in the property that will significantly impair or interfere with the building's preservation value. So it kind of has two parts to it there where it's talking about um, maintaining in perpetuity the the retaining the exterior of the building. That's again the 1927-28 building, but then also making sure that nothing is done to the property um, that would impair or interfere interfere with the building's uh, preservation values. 
Um, here, so there's a requirement to kind of maintain the property, um, you know, just doing routine maintenance to make sure it doesn't fall into disrepair. And then there's kind of this section where there's um, activities where, which are strictly prohibited. There's activities which are allowed, but only with review by the historical commission. And then there's kind of more minor activities which can be undertaken kind of under uh, the guys under routine maintenance. And so, you know, here's kind of, you know, one, one, two, three, four, five activities which are, you know, strictly prohibited, um, such as, you know, complete demolition or relocation of the, you know, 1927-28 building, um, erecting any sort of barrier that might block the view towards the building. Um, and that view is defined as the one from Amity Street is kind of the important view um, of the front facade of the 1927-28 building. Um, dumping ashes or rubbish or any offensive materials on the property, you know, transmission lines or subdividing the, the, the property. And so those are the ones that are like strictly prohibited. So those would not be allowed under really any circumstances, except uh, potentially like a, a tornado or a fire, you know, would create some conditions, which obviously that could destroy the building, but um, but they can't intentionally do that, obviously. So, and then there's kind of these conditional rights, which can be, which define activities, which can be undertaken with review by the historical commission and with review and approval by the historical commission. So, um, and yeah. would you yeah. mind, I'm sorry to interrupt, but would you mind promoting uh, Jan Marquardt? Oh, awesome. Yeah, sure thing. Thank you. Uh, let's see. All right, Jan should be joining us. Awesome. Hi, Jan. Hi, I've been promoted. Yes. <laughs> Sorry I'm late, everybody. Okay. We, we are um, on the first agenda item, um, just reviewing the Jones Library historic preservation restriction um, before taking a vote. Um, the trustees of the library uh, approved it today. So this is the next step. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I've been watching for a little while. So. Okay. Great. So yeah, essentially, I was just saying there's um, certain activities which would can be undertaken, but would require permission from the historical commission. Um, so that's Andrew show the comic any changes to the exterior building, additions to an alteration, partial removal, construction, remodeling, the facades. Um, Activities by the grantor to maintain the exterior of the building. So it's essentially it's it's anything short of complete demolition or major overhaul of the facade needs to be um, reviewed. And I'm going to scroll down quickly to uh, this appendix F, which kind of outlines major and minor activities. Um, and so this is kind of the an important piece of this whole thing where it defines. You know, minor activities are can be kind of done on a routine basis without um, review by the historical commission, but it's the major activities which um, would require review and approval by the historical commission. So, you know, it's separated into categories here. So, painting, um, you know, windows and doors. They can do regular maintenance. You know, caulking and painting and reglazing, but if they're going to do wholesale replacement of windows and doors, then that would require review by the historical commission. You know, exterior changes, so if they want to do spot replacements of existing roofing, they can do that as long as it's in-kind replacement. But then larger scale, um, you know, changing or removal of materials, building elements, that kind of stuff would require um, Commission review and approval. And then we go down to landscaping. So, you know, altering or removing significant landscape features such as gardens, you know, walks, planting, 
that would require commission review. Um, and again, I think it's important to note that the this is all all this review is all done kind of with the perspective of how does it impact the kind of the historic integrity of the original you know 1928 library. So um, that's kind of the focus of the restriction um, is is to for the commission to make that determination of how certain activities would impact the yeah integrity of the 1928 building though the restriction itself is on the entire property. So just wanted to make that distinction. Ben, could you please go to the last paragraph in Exhibit F? Yes. Um, which is sometimes not well understood by uh, okay. just whenever, you know, when people generally talk about preservation restrictions, they think it's a it's a, com a complete and total prohibition, but it um, right. Last paragraph, I think, explains really what the role of the commission is and uh, the grantee in this case, and um, and the purpose of the of the review process. Yeah, right. So it's not necessarily to preclude preclude future changes. It's to you know have an opportunity for the uh, historical commission to assess the alteration and the impact on the integrity of the building. So oh, thanks, Ben, for um, walking us through that. Um, are there uh, questions or comments from members of the commission? Then um, uh, may someone make a motion to um, approve and accept the restriction or uh, whatever motion you think is appropriate in this case? Uh, I move to accept the uh, preservation restriction. I second. 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 Okay. Uh, I think so. That was Robin, and then Pat was the the second. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other discussion? Then let's go ahead with a roll call vote, um, and just. I'll, Cast your vote when your name is called. Um, Patricia Auth. I accept and approve. Catherine Davis. I also accept and approve. Robin Fordham. Uh, in favor. Becky Lockwood. I accept and approve. Jan Marquart. Yes. Uh, Any startup? Uh, you're muted. Sorry, I'm muted. Um, I'm in favor. And Jane Wald, um, I approve and accept. Um, so we can then uh, arrange for signatures before a notary at, at town hall. So yes, I will do that. Yeah, we have, uh, I think there's two different town staff members in town hall who are notaries. So I think we'll set up a, some sort of system to okay. have folks come in on maybe offer okay. a few days and times. Very good. Okay. Um, all right. Then our next item is review and discuss the policy on historic preservation restrictions, which is a framework for us to discuss further. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, more, more systematic and reasonable ways to um, deal with historic preservation restrictions in Amherst. And so, um, Ben. Yeah, was it, Catherine, did you have your hand up? I just happened to see that there was a hand raised from the attendees, and I, I know it's not the time, but I, I didn't know if you had oh, yeah. seen that it was there. I think it's gone now. Okay. Um, we can take, uh, well, let's see. Um, Okay, um, Hilda, would you like to make a comment? Yeah, I, I did, have, I did. You have, because you have, read... Excuse me a second, you have three minutes. Well, I don't need three minutes. I just was disappointed that you took the vote before I had a chance to talk because I think there are other people that have also read that restriction and have the same kind of a question. <clears throat> we all listened to Mr. Gradoya and we were blown away by his report. And, and this, 
it says in in I can give you the exact citation from the other page, but basically it's preserve the exterior of the building. But at the same time, they say that they will follow all the state, local, and and federal laws with regard to preservation, and included in another sentence, the national. Um, Department of the Interior standards. And from Mr. Gradoya's report, I understood that that included, they could not touch the inside of the building, that the, the rooms in the building had to be used the way they were used originally, which of course that's gone by the wayside years ago when they started changing the use of the rooms, making the main reading room, the children's room, et cetera, et cetera. But many of us are very concerned that that interior is going to be totally decimated with no intention whatsoever to, to try to preserve <laughs> any of the, the beautiful wood carving and the, the extensive efforts that were made to make that interior beautiful and, and at an expense that could never be replicated today. The skills are gone. And, and so they're saying that it's only for the exterior, but they're going to abide by all of these rules. And, and to me, that's a contradiction. And I was hoping that somebody on the committee, since you got so excited about the 1970s sorority house and whether there's a reason to save it, to me and to a lot of other of us, there's good reason to save the interior of that building. And, and, and there's a lot of angry people out here that, that that's going to be going. And, and I was rather counting on you guys to help us save it. So it's too late now, you voted yes, you can't retract the vote, but I'm just expressing my anger. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your comment and uh, for your expression, uh, for expressing your concern and, um, uh, and on, the beha on behalf of others too. So we will um, take note of that. Um, let's see, Sarah McKee is, uh, has a hand up. Yes, thank you very much, Jane. Sarah McKee, 9 Chadwick Court, Amherst. Um, I too am sorry that you took the vote before public comment. Um, and these are points I've raised previously, but I think they still are valid. There actually were two grant agreements, not a single grant agreement. I'm looking at page two, um, the third whereas from the bottom, there were two separate grants for two separate projects and the, um, the project to restore the, the um, slate roof was the first project on which I worked when I became a library trustee in 2009, the slates were falling off. Um, and the potential liability was terrible. Um, so it, it seems to me that it would be more appropriate to mention two projects, two grant agreements and two separate grants, one for 80,000 and then the $60,000 grant for the chimneys. It was only when the guys got up on the roof to fix the roof that they found that the chimneys were ready to totter. And my second concern is on the indemnification. And Ben, um, I realize you said you can't speak to this, but the, the grantor here is the Jones Library Incorporated, which is, as you know, a separate nonprofit. And unless the, its liability policy has been raised since I hiked it personally when I was trustee president from 1 million to 2 million in 2011, it's only $2 million. I doubt that anybody's paid any attention to that since. Um, and the, the liability um, indemnification still makes no sense to me. Um, I'm, I'm sorry that um, I did not follow this as closely as it needed to be followed, but thank you very much for, for mentioning these things, letting me mention these things. Uh, thank you for your comment, Sarah. Um, um, I think I, I'm not necessarily going to make any other comment except that um, the Historical Commission um, is taking on the responsibility of um, reviewing 
plans and proposals for uh, work at the Jones Library. And I think we'll be doing that um, with uh, gravity and seriousness. So, uh, but it's helpful to um, hear, hear the concerns of um, patrons of the library and very interested parties. So thank you. Um, let's see. Um, so let's, let's take up, um, let's take up the policy on historic preservation restrictions. Um, sure. Yeah, I think, uh, we had a uh, good and productive conversation about this last time. Um, and it's kind of uh, obviously a good time to talk about it kind of as we just accepted a, a preservation restriction for the first time in a while. So um, I guess for the benefit of members of the public who are in attendance, um, <clears throat> we had a conversation last meeting last month about kind of refining uh, the historical commission and the, I guess overall the town's policy on how and when preservation restrictions are required, um, or I would say permanent preservation restrictions are required when uh, attached to CPA funding, understanding that, uh, you know, it can sometimes take a decade to prepare a preservation restriction and all the negotiations that are involved. And it really kind of does a, disservice to the whole point, which is to protect the town's investment in of public funds into a uh, into a into <coughs> a preservation. So, you know, it's important to that the preservation restrictions are streamlined, are easy to implement, um, are obviously effective once they are implemented. Um, so last time we were talking about, you know, it doesn't make sense to maybe set a threshold, but you know, like a monetary threshold for when a permanent restriction is required, which necessitates, you know, the Massachusetts Historical Commission's involvement, which adds a lot of time and complexity versus maybe just for some minor projects, we can focus on a local uh, restriction, which has a term limit of 30 years, um, but doesn't necessarily require the involvement of the Massachusetts Historical Commission. Um, so hopefully the process could just go a lot quicker um, and would just be a negotiation between the Historical Commission and the grant, the grantee. Um, so yeah, it was interesting last time um, we talked about, you know, you know, 30 years is still a pretty long time for like a local restriction. And I think Catherine raised the point like, for some of these entities, it's it's more likely than not that they would probably uh, apply for more CPA funding within that 30-year window. And so in effect, the 30-year window would just continuously kind of shift forward um, and almost you know act as a permanent restriction in some ways um, because that 30-year restriction just continues to be extended. Um, so, that was kind of where we left it last time. Um, there was some kind of talk about maybe raising the threshold by which a permanent restriction is required to, you know, something like 500,000 or something quite large so that it really only captures the most complex and the largest investments, but that for some of the smaller, you know, or I mean, still quite substantial projects, but, you know, it, it could just be a more streamlined process. Um, so uh, since last meeting, what I've done is kind of just get some, I've reached out to maybe, you know, five or seven towns across the state kind of varying. And, you know, I talked to East Hampton, North Hampton uh, folks in Concord and Lexington and Newton and down in Barnstable. And yeah, I kind of just, uh, I knew I knew a few people personally, and also just kind of did some cold call, even emails, and just to get a sense of how other towns in Massachusetts handle this. Knowing that obviously, where Amherst is just one of 350 towns, and you know we're probably not the only ones facing this dilemma. And I think what I heard was uh, pretty helpful. I got a lot of validation that 
um, preservation restrictions are incredibly onerous and cumbersome and require a great deal of staff time and um, to implement and to actually prepare. So that was kind of validation number one was like, all right, this is actually a really difficult thing. And it's not just Amherst that makes it difficult. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, different, the, I will say this is all coming stemming from a statute in the Massachusetts general laws that uh, governs the Community Preservation Act. And the Community Preservation Act statute has this vague um, language that says a preservation restriction is required when a town is um, acquiring a property, uh, acquiring a real interest in the property. And so it's that clause, like every town kind of interprets what a real interest is. And so for some towns, they really only get into, they only really require a restriction when a, when a property is acquired by the town, like actually the town is buying um, the property and making it a public facility, for example, um, they would require a restriction. But if it's just for a rehabilitation, um, even, you know, even, so uh, then a restriction would be required, understanding that it's, you know, just a lot of work to prepare. And, you know, for some smaller, Amherst is kind of in the middle of we have a professional planning department, but it's um, we're kind of somewhere in the middle of a small town in some of the larger cities where we have the staff to do some of this work, but not to do, you know, we only have so much time in, in town hall and a lot of things to do. So, um, you know, for some towns, they just don't really have a planning staff or they have one planner and they don't really, it's too much for them to require a restriction for every time CPA money is, is allocated. Um, so that was interesting is just understanding that not all towns require a restriction um, for even for rehabilitation projects. And then two, um, second takeaway was that some um, towns requ actually require the applicant to do the work of preparing the restriction, which I thought was interesting. Um, so essentially it would be at the applicant's cost and uh, I, I assume when I hear that, that probably means that the applicant's hiring a lawyer uh, to prepare the restriction, um, or you know, or maybe there's CPA funds that are used to hire um, some legal help to prepare the restriction. So that was interesting too, because um, you know we had we could have the capacity to maybe for each of these projects, like there's five to ten thousand dollars allocated to help with the restriction. Um, and just get some external help to work on it. I think that could help streamline the process. Um, and yeah, I think also, um, I'm not necessarily recommending this, but it was interesting. Um, in some towns, uh, instead of a preservation restriction, they actually made like a, a, a local historic district just right around the property, like a one property local historic district. Um, which in effect, you know, kind of has a, is in the same way as, you know, could be considered as having a restriction on the property. Um, those also, as I think some of us probably know, though it's not easy to set up a local historic district either. So um, I was kind of curious. I mean, I, I, they feel like the same amount of work probably, but, um, but I just thought it was interesting that there's kind of other approaches out there. So um, yeah, that was kind of my home. I have some of that written up, just I have notes that I've taken. I, I'm happy to share that out. If, I know that was probably a lot to digest, but um, it was just interesting to get some input from other cities and towns across the state. And um, I don't know if it provided any clarity necessarily, but it just kind of gave me some reassurance that uh, kind of every town does something a little bit different and there's no clarity. <laughs> on how it should be done. So <laughs> curious. Um, yeah, I just found that surprising. Um, which, you may have said this, Ben, and I might have missed it, but were other, any other towns trying to do what we're doing? Bring, bring um, so yeah, so no, no town used like a financial threshold necessarily, like in Northampton. They evaluate it kind of more on a case by case basis um, and don't necessarily have like a set in stone threshold. 
And I heard that from some other towns as well. But yeah, no, I specifically asked that, like, do you have a, a, a monetary threshold? And no one indicated they did. So that was interesting. Yeah. Um, Jan. Um, I really like this phrase, but I forget what it was. Something about real vested interest. What was the term? Um, yeah, it was like acquire a real interest in the property. Acquiring a real interest. I mean, to me, that's much more significant than just helping with some renovation or something. It, it sounds a real interest. I mean, almost sounds like it has to be more than 50% of the value. I don't know. But if we go back to my example that I used last time, you know, say we have this barn that needs stabilization and it's going to cost, well, to put it over your threshold, say it's going to cost 125,000, right? which puts it over that automatic threshold you were considering that it would need a restriction. But if the whole property, say it's a decent sized piece of land and there's a historic house, say it's worth, I don't know, 800,000. This is, this is not 50% of the value. You know, it's not, it, it's, it seems to me it's a drop in the bucket when it comes to the kinds of things we have to do to places now. And I think that phrase is really crucial to um, our understanding of whether or not we have to do these restrictions on every CPA grant, particularly smaller ones. But the town is not acquiring a real interest if they're giving 50,000 to have um, you know, a, a bell tower reinforced. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem to me. They're not acquiring mm -hmm. any interest in the property. They're just helping maintain it. You know, So that's, that phrase just struck me. Yeah, um, agreed. Um, Becky? Um, yeah, we're, we're not quite there yet with this issue, but we did talk a little bit about implementing and, and, and mostly monitoring and enforcing. Did any, were you able to ask others what they did? I don't know if that came up, other um, towns. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, no, it didn't really come up, um, but... Uh, I guess I, maybe I didn't explicitly ask that necessarily. Right. Um, I was more focused on kind of the nuts and bolts of how the mm -hmm. restriction is implemented. But um, yeah, no, I would definitely. Actually, I will in Barnes Barnstable is they have um, like they have an entire legal team within their town. They have you know a dozen people in their planning department. They have a lot, pretty large wow. municipal government there, and they. They have a pretty robust system of um, uh, inventorying their properties with the restrictions and visiting them and uh, and keeping tabs on them. Um, wow. But uh, yeah, they they offered that information, whereas others didn't right. necessarily comment on that. But no, I think that's a really important point and something that should be adopted in Amherst or looked at carefully. Um, Robin. Um, okay, so I'm just trying to get this clear in my head. So we're talking about CPA grants and restrictions, and we are required to have a restriction when there's a real interest, but not when there's not. Can you clarify that? Just take me from the top down. So you've got a CPA project. What, what is the, what, what, are, what is the town obligated to do in terms of restriction? Um, so I think that, that, uh, that sense of obligation is unclear because the the state statute um, doesn't really offer much more information other than a restriction is required when the town acquires a real property interest. Okay, and, so that's the definition that we're wa working off of and we yeah. don't really know how clear it is. Okay, all right. And yeah. so we, we, it sounds like every town is deciding um, on their own, what that means and how to implement their own restriction yeah. program. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, oh, I just wanted to say uh, I fully uh, advocate using CPA funds to fund the lawyers for this if we need to outsource the, yeah. you know, if that's going to speed things up if by, you know, in a two, one or two year process instead of 10, that seems like a really good and obvious use of CPA funds. Yeah. So. Are there any other questions or comments? And then, uh, if not, uh, uh, 
Ben, if you, oh, uh, I'll finish my sentence and then Robin, I'll ask you to talk. Um, uh, ben, I, I would like it if you would um, tell us what you see the next steps as we, uh, but, um, but I'll let Robin, you, you can wrap up with that, but um, I'll let Robin. Okay, yeah, I mean, just a, a very quick comment that occurred to me that um, a 30 year restriction and a local historic district don't have to be exclusive so that if a, you know, if we had a 30 year restriction on a property, I mean, this would be, I guess, beyond most of our, certainly beyond our tenures, <laughs> but um, that, you know, that a local uh, historic, one property historic district could always be imposed if there was concern toward the end of the restriction about uh, a, a, a desire for continued monitoring, um, you know, if it was a real valuable, had become a real valuable property in some sense. So that's that's another way to think of the 30 years is that the, the, the possibilities don't end at the end of the 30 years. Absolutely, yeah, that's a good point. Um, so I think in terms of next steps, um, I, I guess I want to clarify and confirm, I guess this would be a question for the town's attorney is about the actual process of what it would look like to extend a 30 year restriction like a few times. And is it like a new restriction each time or is it, you know, an amendment to the original restriction and um, how that process works and just making sure it's actually uh, like legal, I guess, to do that um, would be a Good question. There's some limits on, you know, at, for, I don't know what, I guess a, a town can only hold an easement or a restriction like this for 30 years. Um, so I just want to make sure that it's okay to like extend it if it's like a new restriction each time. Um, so that that's one piece of homework I have to do. And then secondly, I think um, uh, when we, uh, this is in two, two more items on the agenda until we talk about the current CPA projects under review, the Conkey House and the Women's Club. I think the result of that, um, deli deliber the town council is kind of deliberating and wavering a little bit on those two projects. Um, and the restriction for each one is like a major kind of point of uh, concern and questioning and I don't, I don't really want to come out with a historical commission's policy until we kind of have some clarity on where the town council stands on those projects is kind of my sense. Um, because it'll be interesting to see kind of what that I think there are never certain members of the town council are going to want to get into the nuts and bolts of what the language and the restriction says and um, and a, that might impact kind of the policy moving forward, I guess, but yeah. We'd probably learn a lot. Yeah, by, exactly. Yeah, yeah. From that process. Um, Jan? I just looked up um, real property interest online <laughs> and you might, when you talk to the lawyers, you might ask them if there is a very specific definition because what I'm finding is it has to do with ownership. Yeah, yeah, so, no, I know. I mean, it might um, be good if we knew. <laughs> I think I think Nate, Nate has asked uh, Sharin, our, our attorney, that, and um, I think that's how we started this whole process of being like, oh, we don't necessarily need a permanent restriction because we're not necessarily acquiring a real property interest. I think it's more about um, the town needs to feel comfortable that their public investment is being protected in some way. So even if it's not a full you know, acquiring of ownership in a property, even by giving, you know, whether it's 10,000 or $100,000 to a property, just feel uncomfortable that the applicant's not gonna turn around and, you know, demolish the property tomorrow or something, or, you know, just that that investment is, you know, um, serving, you know, generations to come and there's a, a benefit to the preserving those structures. Couldn't, so. couldn't we put some language in with the, grant uh, rather than working from a definition that implies ownership when we don't have it i mean could we just not say that if we give you this money if you sign on this dotted line for this money you have to agree not to change things for x number of years or something i mean it would be simpler if the cpa 
Yeah. Contract. Um, right. Yeah, we already do have a grant agreement that applicants need to sign. And the grant agreement that they sign says that they will accept a preservation restriction. Um, I just feel like the restriction itself is uh, provides a greater sense of um, protection because it's you know filed with the registry of deeds and it has this whole enforcement mechanism and um, it's just so much hard work it doesn't happen so if we could just get some wording into the contract and then when both yeah. parties sign it's locked in we could we but could that, follow up with that as well yeah. but the the preservation restriction also allows for I might tell me if I'm correct Ben that it, it allows for review so that uh, so the property owners feel more comfortable with it, that they have, uh, that it's not a 30 year lock on doing nothing. Um, right. They have the opportunity to come before the commission if something needs to change. It's to give us control, but not to keep, to not to lock the building in, in place for, for 30 years. Well, it seems to me it would only be to lock the changes that we're paying for in place, not right. the entire building. So if we're paying for a roof, it's only that they aren't going to do something to change that roof for a while. And that could be in the contract. It wouldn't have to be on the entire property to have a restriction if we're only giving them money. Oh, yeah. I mean, I always assumed that the restriction was to, the purpose of the restriction was to give the, the, the money to, to repair or restore or preserve but that the intention was to maintain the building as it was. Like we wouldn't want the Conkey House stripping off their porch because we gave the money to repair their roof. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm gonna default with the sense that the, the town and the state and the lawyers know. But if they wanted to take up <laughs> their porch, Robin, they'd have to come back to us and ask us separately if they were gonna take Well, I mean, maybe that's an extreme example, but I mean, you know. I don't if we if we didn't have three institutions in town that didn't pay taxes, we could afford more of these, you know, lawyers and planners yeah. and everything. And we have to work within what we have. Right. But we have even, money. You know, the, the most painless solution that allows for us to maintain control yeah. would be a better way to go than to put something in place we're never going to realize. So I think. Let's wrap up discussion on this point for now. Um, ben has identified a couple of things he's he's going to want to to do and uh, research and bring back to us, and um, certainly uh, the direction of what happens with the Conkey House and the Women's Club is going to be very informative to us. So, yeah, okay. Um, Okay, uh, let's see. At this point, the next agenda item uh, is it concerns the Emily Dickinson Museum. So I am going to um, uh, ask Jan to um, be to chair this portion of the meeting, and I'm just going to mute and turn off my camera. And uh, my colleague Shanti Anderhagen is going to uh, make the statement and the request to the historical commission. Okay. And Ben, you're gonna bring this person in? Um, yes. Okay. Shanti, are you with us? I am, just Yay. hi. Hi. <laughs> um, so you're going to present for yeah. the um, Emily Dickinson nice, House. Great. Nice to see all of you. Hetty, lovely to see you. It's been a long, long time. And um, Ben and others, and I'll talk to Jane about this too, um, as, uh, as a, a long time easement administrator, both at Historic New England and the National Trust for Historic Preservation, I'm happy for you guys to pick, pick my brain about any of these <laughs> questions. It's probably a good thing I wasn't let in earlier because I was answering, <laughs> I was talking, I was saying, I can tell you what real property is. I can tell you. So Ben, if you want to have a call at some point to talk through some of the stuff that you're facing and including the CPA stuff, I'm happy that to. That sounds help. great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Super. Okay. Um, I'm going to turn uh, PowerPoint on and uh, let's see. 
I'm going to do a full slide. So can you all see my screen? Nope. No. Did you share uh, it? I have to share it. Yeah, that would be a, that would be a really good thing to do. Uh, let's see. All right. Are you now seeing it? Nope. No. Okay. I could do this. Sure. I can. Okay, here we go. Yay. Okay, right. got it. Go from the beginning. All right. Um, so um, I started working with the uh, Emily Dickinson Museum uh, about a year ago on a number of projects that are in the pipeline. I'm sure you all know about uh, some of the stuff going on at the museum currently. Um, we are uh, at the sort of tail end of a pretty ambitious, a significantly ambitious project at the homestead on interior restoration with some exterior uh, work as well. And so with that uh, starting to, to come to near completion in the next couple of months, we're gearing up for another project, uh, the Evergreens Energy Conservation and HVAC Systems Project. So um, I, I don't actually um, need to tell, all, tell you all about the history of, of the Evergreens. You know that it was um, Emily Dickinson's brother Austin's house. It's to the west of the homestead. Um, it's one of the uh, you know, two museum properties that the museum owns. Um, those of you who haven't been through the Evergreens, may not know that the interior is substantially intact from the 19th century with Dickinson collections uh, in abundance and um, original finishes and just a, an incredibly um, uh, intact uh, assemblage of architecture and collections. Um, but um, the building suffers and therefore the collections suffer from some you know, environmental instabilities. And so this project, which is being supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities pretty significantly, is to work to stabilize the internal environment at the Evergreens and to make sure that the um, uh, collections that are housed, this is primarily a collections driven grant and project, the collections that are housed uh, within the Evergreens um, uh, last into the future in, in good condition. Um, so, uh, as I said, I'm sure you all know about the history. Um, the Evergreens is a National Historic Landmark. It's individually listed on the National Register. It's also in a National Register district. It's in your local historic district. And there's also a preservation restriction held by the Massachusetts Historical Commission. So um, I'll tell you details of the project in a second, but I'm showing you this picture to just indicate that um, at, at the exterior of the building, uh, it's the um, west elevation to the left uh, where there will be um, a bit of work. And that is where the HVAC uh, units, excuse me, the AC condensers, uh, there's one there now, there'll be two there. They're tucked behind shrubs, not really visible at all. The, the right arrow is the um, east elevation, the elevation that faces uh, the homestead. And um, the area where the arrow is, is near the bulkhead and the area way at the uh, north elevation of the main block of the house. And that's where there'll be um, a fair amount of, of uh, activity to address water intrusion at the uh, bulkhead area way and, and at the foundation. Um, and there'll be a couple of other exterior projects uh, that will be going on. Um, so the project is uh, uh, separated into two uh, phases, two parts. One is architectural, non-mechanical, and these are things that will be happening uh, to the building, uh, some at the exterior and some at the interior, to work to stabilize um, the environment in sort of passive ways. So addressing where there's water intrusion and the bulk of that is at the foundation wall that I just talked about at the east elevation and the area way at the bulkhead. Um, so the, the bulkhead will be, um, it's a Bilco, you know, um, metal bulkhead will be replaced with something uh, more appropriate and more historically compatible. 
Um, there'll be some more um, below grade at the foundation to um, uh, ensure that water stops leaking in that area. A number of uh, uh, basement uh, uh, windows in the foundation will be uh, fitted with interior storms to prevent um, air intrusion. Um, at uh, windows, uh, we're looking at a number of different systems for how to keep UV and other light out um, to keep wallpaper and fabrics and art uh, better preserved against UV intrusion. Um, at the attic, um, there will be um, augmentation of existing uh, insulation and a catwalk construction to access the attic. Um, and that is likely to result in some necessary uh, ceiling replacement. Uh, uh, ceilings have fallen, plaster is definitely um, failing in a number of locations. The additional weight of the insulation may require some plaster work. Also at the exterior, there's uh, more water intrusion um, at the roof, uh, at the north elevation. To, as you enter, those of you who know the building, there's a ramp between the main block and the shed. Um, the uh, uh, roofing in one of those areas needs some work, some gutter work. It's constantly causing water leaks there. And then there'll be some chimney repairs to the east chimney, and I'll show you photos of all of that. I won't go into to too much technical detail with mechanical and electrical, but suffice it to say, the systems need to be upgraded to provide a much more stable environment. So that includes, um, importantly, uh, you know, the introduction of new mechanicals, uh, electrical work, including removing the overhead electrical from Main Street, which will obviously contribute to the ambiance of the property um, as it existed historically. And some of the work uh, related to the mechanical has already been accomplished as part of the Homestead project, um, as well as those of you who've seen the property lately, the path uh, between the uh, Evergreens and the Homestead, which was um, uh, completed uh, late last fall. Um, this is just an, an image of the area way on the east elevation that I've, I've described. You see the, the Bilco uh, bulkhead. Um, so that will be replaced with something wood, uh, certainly more compatible. The ramp will be taken away and foundation work will be completed um, in this area of the building. And then the ramp will be reinstalled just as it appears now. The little, um, a uh, photo on the right shows you the, the, the problem of water intrusion right at the bulkhead. It's, uh, it's a, an ongoing issue, which doesn't help the environment on the first and second stories, obviously. Um, this is just an image of the chimney work at the east side. You can see on the left, the existing east chimney, and on the right, the existing west chimney. The proposal includes um, repointing at this chimney and also just uh, restoring the uh, east chimney on the left uh, to its original configuration, meaning it will match the west chimney on the right. This is just a view, uh, Google Street view, uh, to show you generally with the white arrow on the left, the location behind many shrubs, rhododendrons of the um, AC condensers, uh, they really are uh, not visible. Well, the one that exists, there will be one added to that. And on the right, um, you can see where that uh, AC condenser is. We are looking along south toward Main Street along the, the west side of the building, uh, west elevation of the building. So that is a, a, a really minimally to no uh, visibility location. <clears throat> At the interior, uh, the few of the things that I mentioned, um, roller shades will be fitted on, on windows, attic insulation will be augmented to ensure that uh, a cold attic is, is maintained at all times and there's no heat transfer from rooms below. And you can see in the bottom, um, uh, we will uh, fit the basement window openings with um, proper uh, um, interior, clear interior storm. Uh, panels. These are just two photographs illustrating the condition at many of the ceilings in the evergreens. Um, it, over time, I think a combination of both um, water damage on the right, that's a, a chimney on the second story, uh, the ceiling right near the chimney, clearly that was a, a leak uh, related to something related to the chimney. Um, and on the left is just another example of the 
cracked plaster where the plaster has left uh, loosened and, and is leaving the laugh. Um, this condition is pervasive throughout the homestead. So uh, part of the project, part of the goal of the project is to address um, these really deteriorated ceilings. And that's really uh, the scope of the work. So I think what the Emily Dickinson Museum is looking for from the Historical Commission as we begin our journey of numerous um, uh, applications for, uh, for approval for this project, including before your local historic district commission has been those, but also a section 106 review because, one, uh, because uh, this is federally funded uh, grant money. Um, we have to go through a, an approval process for the easement that is on the property, it's interior and exterior. Uh, of course, we will come to the um, access board locally, as well as the state access board. So we have a bit of a, a bit of a, a journey ahead in terms of approvals. And I think what we would really like is to get um, a letter of support from the Historical Commission for this really significant project. And I'm happy to answer questions. And I know Jane will also be, I think she'll probably pop back in um, because she can answer things too, if I can't. Thank you. That was very clear presentation. I think we have a good sense of what you plan to do. Are there any questions from commission members? I'm going to stop. That's a good one. You didn't, we didn't even have any questions. It was <laughs> well, that's fine. And looks like Hetty. Huh. Hetty, did you want to? Yeah, I just had a question about whether there is any, um, it's closed right now. I, this is a very selfish question. I still haven't seen the inside of the Evergreens. Um, and I wonder if as part of the timeline, whether there's any um, desire on the part of um, the owners to sort of show the work as it unfolds or as it gets done. Um, so that we in the community can can see that the house being taken care of and um, for for you know for posterity. <laughs> so I think that's that's definitely a Jane question, but um, you know I certainly know that my experience with the Emily Dickinson Museum over the past year and the the work at the homestead. Um, you know, we are in an unusual circumstance and time with COVID. I think were we not in a period of COVID, I, um, am, I can imagine that there might have been some programming, not excessive, but some programming that might have been um, uh, along that vein, Hetty, of sharing the conservation in action kind of, which um, you may remember from our years together at SPNA was my, close to my heart. I, people love to see this work going on. It, it's really meaningful. So I think it certainly depends on where we are in terms of the circumstance of COVID and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, but you know, uh, I could imagine that if not in real life, maybe virtually, um, there could be snippets of, of information. But yeah, it's definitely a, a Jane question. What I will say is, um, you know, very soon, very, very soon, certainly this uh, spring and summer, um, everyone should please try to make a trip to the homestead because you'll all be just blown away at the, at the um, restoration that the museum has um, undertaken. Uh, it, it, you, will, you will be astonished at the transformation. So that will be one nice opportunity. But yeah, I certainly will, if Jane's not listening, mention to her that that's a thought that, that you care about. Just curious, um, when you replace the plaster ceilings, do you still do lath and plaster or do they use wallboard and just make it look like lath and plaster? Yeah, so, um, well, let me first say, um, we're still exploring uh, whether that is a critically important thing to do. I mean, this is um, not all, there's, there's one gypsum ceiling um, that is sort of a no brainer to replace with plaster. Um, but other ceilings are original plaster. So we're, we're making sure we go through some due diligence uh, that we've explored all the options for retaining the plaster, but it is, it is looking uh, you know, troubling in terms of condition. 
Um, and so it won't be with wood lath, it'll be with wire lath, but it will be a three part plaster. Mm -hmm. And it will, and it will be, it will be undertaken in a very, very careful approach. The hope being always that when you walk in post project, you don't actually know their new ceilings. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the, but the, but the, but the work of wood lath and three-part plaster is enormously uh, excessive. And so um, if we were doing repair sections, definitely it would be, but uh, if it's a full replacement, it's likely wire lath with the three-part, which is what has happened at the homestead too. Thanks. Sure. Anybody else have any comments or questions? Does anybody want to move that we write a letter of support for the project? You have to put your mic on. I mean, you're unmute yourself, Becky. Um, I will move that we write a letter of support to the Emily Dickinson Museum regarding this project at the Evergreens. And I second I'll it. Second. Oh, sorry. We both second sorry, it. Kevin. <laughs> no worries. Okay. Ben, you're keeping track of this, even though we see only the logo? Uh, correct. Yeah. OK, great. Um, any further discussion? I'll work with Jane on exactly what it should say. Um, I guess I'll end up doing it. So <laughs> e either or both of you can advise on <laughs> best wording. Yeah, well, Ben Thank knows you. how to find me. I'm happy to help. <laughs> Thank you so much. So if there's no further discussion, shall we vote on that? Or do we need a vote on something like uh, a letter like this? I mean, we have a motion, we might as well vote, right? But we don't really need a roll call, I don't think. So is there anyone, is everyone in favor? Let's just say that. Yes. Yes, okay, it's unanimous. So we will write a supportive letter. I think it's a great project. Thank you oh. for taking the time to come meet with us. Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much for the help and support. And, um, you know, we will keep you posted. Great. All right, I'm gonna hop off and have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Jane is back. Thank you. Yeah, we, there's, a, there's a great deal of activity at the Emily Dickinson Museum these days, and, uh, and there will be for the next 30 years. I, I... Hey, I have visitors coming this summer. You have to finish so I can get people in there. <laughs> <laughs> but it, yeah, thank you for, thank you for your um, help in, uh, as we try to move through a, uh, a, a really extensive approval process. <laughs> Um, which will take as much time as it will to do the actual building. Um, so let's see, it's uh, 747. We've got just under 30 minutes. And so I think if we need to drop off anything, it would be the February minutes. Um, let's see. Uh, so why don't we go to, let's try to discuss the Conkey House and Hills House, uh, take 10 or 12 minutes to do that so that we can also get an update on the preservation bylaw, which is, is also kind of turning along. So, um, um, so the, uh, Robin. Um, okay, I'm gonna jump right in here. Um, because we have this uh, town council forum coming up and I just wanted to give a recap of my experience of the movement of the Conkey House and the Hills House through CPA. And I know that I'm, um, I'm, I'm jumping in a little bit of petty here, but um, I've made a bunch of public comments and she's shaking her head, giving me the go ahead. So, <laughs> so I would say uh, at the CPA meeting, I made a point of making public comment about the fact that, um, and I think Hetty made this point too, that um, uh, members there were not aware that public, that private entities could receive CPA funds, um, a further understanding of uh, the public benefit being the visual view of the building. It's not necessary to be able to enter the building in order to provide a public benefit for a historic preservation project. 
And um, once that information was given to the CPA committee, I think there was a lot more support for these projects um, and they were voted forward. And then I also attended, and I think Jane also attended and spoke at the finance committee meeting um, where they, and Ben, you can help me along here. They, they recommended everything else and then held these two projects back. Is that correct? Essentially. Um, they have not recommended yeah, yeah exactly and so i uh made a public statement trying to explain the concept of public benefit uh and um because i was at that point i was less concerned about uh the understanding that a private entity can receive cpa funds that's just a fact it's not really a um anything that we need to to debate and um once I made public comment and Jane did. My impression from the committee at that point, and I'm forgetting the counselor's name, I should know it at this point. Um, there were there were at least two people who said, oh, I'm not worried about the public benefit. There seemed to be concern about it was it was concern that was framed in the sense of like we have other we may have other projects coming down the pike that need cpa funding and uh i don't i think the counselor's statement was uh the sense that like that maybe these projects weren't important enough to fund and i'm 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 interpreting but it, but they both said they both basically said that they weren't concerned about the public benefit aspect, that it was more of a fiscal responsibility question. And so um, my intention was to be to write to the counselors to try to figure, I'm trying to figure out what exactly it is they're objecting to, because it seems like the goalpost keeps moving so that I could provide further public comment to um, address those objections. And I would say that my, my main concern is that there is unease about these projects because they're not so obviously public town projects that that that, that unease is, is fueling um, the resistance to recommending them. And I feel like that falls into the camp of what I'm sort of learning in my studies is an arbitrary ruling. It's not really based on the rules around CPA. The projects are eligible for CPA. They've been vetted by two committees. They both have urgency. And I feel strongly that that's not a grounds for not recommending them. If the finance committee doesn't want to recommend them, I would still appeal to the town council to approve them anyway, because it's up to them um, in, in the final measure, right? They take everyone's recommendations in hand and then they decide going forward there but that would be that would be the grounds that I would assume I'd be making an argument on the basis of but I'm just really not clear on what people are really um, feeling uh, um, some concern about but I, I do sense that it's these large uh, large ticket items for projects that aren't owned by the town and um, that's what makes historic preservation under CPA unusual. And I think um, I would wanna provide some clarity around that, 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 that these are exactly the kind of projects that we would expect and that they have both have urgency and that should not be a grounds for, for not approving them. Thank you. That seems to be what is happening. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, so, um, Ben, will the will the town legal counsel have any uh, response before mm. the before this meeting coming up? Um, well, I don't I don't think there's any question of the eligibility of these projects. Um, town council members understand that the projects are eligible. I think it's and uh, I mean I guess we have clarified that with a town attorney and provided that information to the finance committee last meeting. Um, but yeah, no, I think Robin, you kind of got at the heart of the issue is, um, it's a, in my mind, it's a combination of 
uh, I think there is still some misunderstanding of the public benefit a little bit. Maybe that needs to be reinforced a bit more that it's, yes, these buildings aren't necessarily open to the public all the time, but it's the, it's the you know, historic atmosphere. It's the ambiance that they create on the street. You know, they're both on Main Street as people are coming up towards the center of town. These aren't, you know, buildings way back in the woods that are out of view. You know, they are prominent historic structures on the- yeah, I was you know, uh, I was driving on, on Shumway today and, and uh, the Conky Stevens house is yeah, it's right there. front and center yeah. as you're yeah. coming down the street, so. Yeah, and so I think um, reinforcing that, and then I think it's um, again it kind of, a lot of the focus was on the restriction because they were questioning like how you know what is the again you know and you can look at the restriction as a benefit to the town as well because it's um, it's an opportunity to you know permanently preserve uh, those two buildings. Um, and the applicant gets something in terms of, you know, uh, 100 to $250,000 in rehabilit money for rehab. The town gets something for, in terms of a permanent preservation restriction and, you know, the, the, the um, you know, the fact that these buildings will be rehabilitated and preserved. So, um, yeah, I think for the Conkey House, it's kind of, it's interesting that they're lumping them together because the Conkey House has yes. unique has unique circumstances because it's like a condo, condoized office building. And so they were kind of questioning like, well, what does that mean for the individual office owners? And do they, you know, what happens if they sell? Does the, you know, and all these kind of situational questions and at the end of the day, you know, we made it very clear the restriction runs with the land. It's on the property. Um, it it's the building is owned by the uh, you know the trustees of the you know condo association. So it's um, yeah, I think there wasn't really any concern in our mind about it being a condo building. Um, I don't really know. I think. I think there, there's a, a lot of questions being asked and at the end of the day, maybe they just don't like the project <laughs> and um, <laughs> they're maybe just trying to find a lot of ways to see if the project could be determined to not be eligible. And, you know, at the end of the day, they, they do, you know, control the purse strings or whatever. So mm -hmm. if, if they don't want to recommend the project, then they don't have to, but I think they need to be mindful of the precedent that it sets and understand the impacts and the implications right. for that. Right. And, you know, both for future applicants, but then also for the CPA commission, the historical commission and town staff, right. you know, because based off of what I've heard from uh, the historical commission and from the CPA commission, I was like actively recruiting these private entities like the Conkey House and the Women's Club because I knew folks were sick of, you know, town buildings <laughs> um, <laughs> seeking funds. So, you know, I'm, we all made a concerted effort to reach out to these entities. And now we're hearing from town council that, oh no, we, you know, we really want to fund projects that are, you know, more accessible to the public. So just kind of oh. whatever they decide, I just hope that, you know, sets some. But then, so the finance committee makes a recommendation, but then the town council vote is what actually passes yeah. it to the town council. So if I'm making public comment to the town council, I mean, I've already made my public comment to the finance committee. So um, that should be, uh, they can they can essentially not recommend it and it can still pass if we convince the town's council. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So I, I think, I think yeah. you ought to make your statement same statement to the town council i was gonna um i was gonna submit the statement that i that i made to the finance committee in writing to the town council but also um i wanted to prepare a secondary statement on the basis of the decision can't be arbitrary like it can't be based yes. on the fact that there's you know we anticipate another project coming looking for cpa funds 
Yeah. Um, and, it, and it can't be made on the basis of an individual uh, redefining what historic preservation or rehabilitation right. is. Right. Right, if they have a concern that they need to leave two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars aside for CPA, then you know why are they choosing these two particular projects? You know, when you could, there are other projects there that could wait another year. You know, that could, that aren't as pressing. I mean, that that's that's the argument that I would intend to make. But yeah, okay, um, okay, and that's on Monday. Is it Monday? Yep, it's on Monday. Yeah. Okay. Oh boy. Okay. Um, Becky? I think Ben just brought up a really good point about actively seeking out privately owned properties. Um, it is it is in the, you know, it, it's within our right to, to um, work with privately owned properties for the preservation. And it, and I really think it's pretty clear cut that you either include these properties as you do everyone else, because that's what's in the in the in the plans and and you know and the work, or you don't. And if you don't, you need to change the preservation plan, and I don't know whatever else you need to change. To be very clear, because you can't have people applying again, getting to the end, and then right. you know not understanding why they can't. So I think it's real important we get it straightened out in some fashion for all of us. Um, Jan? I can't remember if I told you this before, but you know, last year, members of the CPA committee reached out to every district in town asking homeowners, encouraging homeowners to apply so there would be more private funding. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, this is going contrary to what they're hoping to do. And the finance committee clearly doesn't know that, right? So well, something needs to change. Um, I mean, just just to be clear, and I'll be quick. Um, they did they did not come to a point where they they were objecting on the basis of funding a private project. I think that that might be the feeling behind it, but the statements were were different than that. They were a concern. They were a fiscal concern about the overall amount. Uh, you know, I mean, it shifted, but 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 in the end. They, they accepted all those arguments, so. Um, it's about eight o'clock, so we may need to um, summarize what our next steps here are. Um, just one, one comment or one thought is, um, you know, I think some of this is getting, I guess from my perspective, some of it's getting tangled up with, you know, why is it that we wanted to encourage private homeowners to come forward? Mm -hmm. Um, and I think one of the answers is uh, that we were, you know, seeing a lot of town projects, which were maybe partly restoration, but, you know, partly not. And um, the Historical Commission can make a judgment about what is properly historic restoration. Uh, but I think that we found... Um, that that judgment was not necessarily accepted. Uh, so I, I think what we're trying to do is create a mixture of recipients, um, not to block one or the other, but just to have a, a, a healthier mix mm -hmm. of how our CPA um, historic preservation funds are being spent. Um, so let's see, Robin, you're, you're writing and are you gonna show up? Yeah, I will show up. Okay, yep. um, I'll plan to be there and I, I hope I can write something too. Um, and I, we can maybe coordinate. Um, so uh, uh, are there any thoughts or suggestions for what we, what we present to uh, on Monday, that you'd like to you'd like to make sure get in there or strategies, um, anything like that. Seems to me that the larger the property and therefore the more expensive these kinds of repairs are, the more important it is that 
we support owners or CPA supports owners because if not, the town will, the bigger, more obvious historic properties will start to look run down and that's gonna be the worst thing for the, um, you know, the, the streetscape that we're trying to, to maintain. Um, so, you know, the town is not going to let main town buildings go to rack and ruin. There may be times when they need help with things, and fine, but the, it must have been that CPA was reaching out to private owners because they're the ones who really need the help since the town can't step in if somebody's letting their historic properties start to get shabby, but we can offer mm -hmm. funds towards it, right? And that's going to be the best way to keep a historic um, center looking right. good. Right. Jackie? So, um, Jane, I, I just I just wanted to add that I think your your explanation of the background of why we were seeking out the mix of funding is really important. I you know there's new people there are new people here and there or maybe people on the finance committee that don't understand you know the the detailed workings of of our work and and I think explaining it might might help too. Thank you. Um Let's see, Pat, then Robin. I'm, I'm um, finding it difficult to appreciate where the finance committee is coming from when, as we sit here in the Amherst Historical Commission, our role is to preserve the significant properties in town. And, and those are privately owned. We've We've supported town renovations to libraries and, and other things. But I think that, that the fact that there's being this, this um, I wanna use the word disingenuine um, differentiation between private ownership or not. Um, every property aside from a town, a property owned by the town yeah. is private ownership. And if it's a significant property, it, it, it has a right um, to request CPA funds to, to restore and, and maintain. So how do we as a commission, or can we, or do we state, state this, the idea of, of the, 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 the requests come from properties that are deemed significant to the town? and ought to be treated equally. Robin? Um, so in uh, just addressing that, uh, it, that point has been made clearly over and over again. Um, again, you know, we've kind of gone through with, with, all, with, with all the, with both the CPA and the finance committee that the project is allowable, uh, private properties are eligible, um, there are essentially no issues there um, in terms of, of the legality. We can certainly uh, reinforce that. And Jane, I think that I, I was gonna take sort of a procedural approach, but if you wanted to take this great approach about balancing our, our recipients um, and the importance of stressing the fact that private owners in fact have no other sources of funding for historic <laughs> preservation, um, I was gonna, going to try to uh, mm -hmm. ascertain from town councilors where their concerns are so that I might address them, but also to just mm -hmm. reinforce the idea that if you're going to take $250,000, mm -hmm. $300,000 out of the entire CPA budget for this year, there is money for these projects. It's there. Right. It's not, right. We're not, it, uh, if, if they feel that they need that kind of reserve, it appears that they're sing singling out historic preservation and that's an arbitrary decision. And they have to have better reasoning for um, finding that $300,000 than these projects are not uh, in, in public ownership. So that will, so that will be my approach. And I will also, like I said, I'll just re resubmit my statement about understanding what a, a public, visual public benefit is that might be useful. Is there a role for the Amherst Historic Commission to make a statement to that effect or, or no? no? Well, I think Jane and I will both make public comments so that will, uh, as members of the Historic Commission. Okay. So, no. okay. 
Okay. Um, Hetty, and then we'll move on. I can, I can attend the meeting as well. And, and Jane and Robin, I'm happy to read things, edit things. Um, as I listen to all of this, I just think, you know, if you, if the, if the, um, Women's Club and the Conkey Stevens House weren't there, we would have a very different perception of our arrival in Amherst. Um, someone mentioned streetscape, and I think that's really important for property values, let alone anything else. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's an incredibly historic street, partly because of the Emily Dickinson House at the top of it. Um, and that house in, and the Evergreens relates to these two other buildings very fairly closely in terms of building type. So I think I, I think the the case could be made that these two buildings are very much in the public interest in terms of their preservation. Um, you know, it, and as I said, I'll come to the meeting, you know, on Zoom and um, a little tired tonight, but I <laughs> will try and uh, help you both um, with anything you just want to run by me. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot, Hetty. Yeah. Um, it, ben, do we, let's see, we'll, so we can take public comment after, if, if you need to leave, um, but um, uh, do, do we need to address preservation bylaw proposal? Um, yeah, only just that the, uh, so I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, it's a big, uh, kind of a big moment for the preservation bylaw. After all these years, it's finally being presented to the full town council on Monday. So uh, on Monday, there's going to be the, you know, public forum about the CPA projects, I think at 630. And then at some point between 7 p.m. and I don't know, like 9 p.m., uh, and on the agenda is the presentation of the preservation bylaw. And so that presentation on Monday will kind of kick off like a maybe two month process where they will, the town council will, will refer the bylaw to the planning board and the, their uh, subcommittees of the town council for a review and public hearing process. And then, you know, they will get after those public hearings, there will, there will be a recommendation. Um, essentially, the recommendation is to repeal Article 13 and then to adopt this new general bylaw. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's it's finally finally has come the, uh, the moment of um, kind of getting referred and going through the, those motions. So um, I've asked uh, Jan and Jane to come to Monday's meeting. Um, and, you know, our hope is, you know, we're presenting this as like a joint proposal between town staff and the historical commission. Uh, we've also, we've both worked on it so much over the past, what, like seven years, maybe going back quite a while. So, um, yeah, I think uh, I'm, it kind of came up quickly. I. I thought we would have like another few weeks to present the town council, but they are, they're getting, get into like their budget season in the next few months. So they wanted to get the zoning bylaw or the, the bylaws out of the way. So I'm frantically writing a memo, which kind of will accompany the, uh, the bylaw and it'll be presented together. And the memo kind of just gives an overview of the three, the major changes that are being made and the kind of process moving forward. Um, and I think, um, yeah, I don't know. The only kind of discussion point I wanted to ask about was, and I, I mentioned this to Jane last week, was still, we're still a little hung up on this definition of demolition and how, it, how the part C works. Um, so as you know, like the current definition of demolition is really vague. It's like any act, any, act of demolishing or you know or removing a building or a portion thereof and we've developed this kind of three-part definition so the three the definition is you know total destruction or de demolition you know 25 percent or more of uh, elevation and then this part c which was you know removing or modifying important architectural elements and 
I think I mentioned this last time, but we had some concerns about, you know, kind of opening the floodgates to every property in town who, who wants that that's 50 years or older and having to review, you know, minor architectural changes, you know, for, for all, I think like 6,000 homes in Amherst. And so we kind of settled on filtering it out a little bit so that we're really just looking at for this section of the definition, um, it's really just looking at the, the you know, the, hopefully the most historically significant buildings in Amherst. And so we were, we've kind of been wavering about how do we actually um, filter that out. And so at first we settled on, oh, we'll have like a town, you know, inventory of historic buildings and we can, you know, loosely base that on Macris. Um, and then, you know, I think there was some concern about like, oh, well, that might be a lot of work to like maintain that database and update it periodically. And, um, and, and also, and whereas, you know, at Macris, the state does a good job of maintaining that for us. And it has basically the full extent of the town's inventory up there. So I made this change a few weeks ago saying like, oh, we'll just say this only applies to buildings on Macris. However, um, you know, I think there's some concern about um, it might it might just make sense to keep this language like flexible and not necessarily you know just just say you know we can call it like the like for buildings uh, you know on the town's inventory voted on by the historical commission you know blah blah, blah the act of modifying or removing and if we Kind of adopt some more flexible language it might allow you know that you on the commission could just call that you know we're going to say the town's inventory is basically what's on macris and just keep it simple and call it that but it might be the case that in a few years it's actually you know maybe macris has grown to a substantial number of properties and it's you know becoming too hard to implement this project this uh, definition here and maybe they want to kind of shrink the what this applies to, and it's a smaller list of properties. So I was going to propose maybe, and maybe we, we don't necessarily need to do this for Monday. There's always some room to change after the referral by town council, but I, I'm just still kind of hung up on this section here and um, wanting to add some flexibility, I guess, um, is my main concern. So I'm curious if anyone has any thoughts. I do have to go in like five or so minutes, but happy to discuss a little bit here. Um, Pat, did I see your hand? Oh, you're muted, sorry. Pat. Pat, you're on mute. Pat, you were muted the entire time. Okay, got it, got yeah. it. Um, the other that 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 flag interfered, but but when I was working with the Sunset South Whitney, you know the the, the uh, Lincoln um, group, um, I did did a whole macro search all, all on the North Pleasant Street, and then um, because that was the historic commission thought we should um, take the leader participate, and as it turns out. They, they, as a local district, are already authorized to take the lead. But what we discovered in the process is that a lot of the side streets that have significant properties, um, that those properties are not listed on Macris. And the local historic district was going to set about trying to do that. So I, I see where you're coming from, Ben, but I'm wondering if there can be an, an, an and or that, that it be a macris and or identified by local mm -hmm. um, historic districts. And that might give the flexibility uh, until it, the, the properties can be listed or, or maybe yeah. they won't yeah. ever be. Yeah. No, I think adding, yeah, whether we add a, you know, and or kind of section here or just, you know, refer to 
you know, maybe it's something we do in the rules and regulations of the historical commission where, you know, there's a, a procedure for adding and modifying a list. I think it's important to have that level of flexibility. Um, right, because there, there, there may be um, properties in the process of being identified by local historic districts or identified by local historic districts that aren't listed on MACRIS. Yeah. And that's what we found in this, this um, Sunset Lincoln, um, South Whitney is, is just that there were a lot of side street properties yeah. that weren't listed, that were eligible to be listed. So yeah. anyway, I just add that to the, to the mix of the conversation. Yeah. I, I thought also that one reason for identifying a specific inventory was um, to, so that it would be easier for homeowners to find information about their own house. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, right now with Macris, um, you're not notified if your house is added to the list. Um, so you wouldn't really know. Um, so yeah, that's another concern about using the stat. It's kind of a trade-off, you know, the state maintains Macris, so we town staff wouldn't have to, but it also creates maybe some extra work for us to notify homeowners and uh but whereas, you know, if, if we were to maintain the list and, you know, update it periodically and, and all that, that's a little bit more work for town staff, but maybe, you know, homeowners are kept in the loop better because it's handled locally. So, um, yeah, it's kind of about finding that balance. Um, and I think actually Pat raised an interesting point, and maybe this is a whole other can of worms, but uh, do we want this? definition to apply to buildings in the local historic district. I mean, just as a reminder, the local historic district um, commission, they review very carefully and heavily scrutinize all changes, removal or addition to any house in the district. So um, in my mind, they kind of have that covered, this, this section here. And I, I would feel it'd be a little bit redundant. Um, to have the historical commission also look at, you know, the, re the removal of architectural elements. Um, because I mean, the local historic district can flat out did not reject the idea of someone removing elements. I mean, and the commission would more so put a delay on that if you so choose, so chose, but I'd just be curious. I, that, I have a feeling that would come up at a council meeting or, or subcommittee hearing. Um, so I'm going to make a little suggestion and then Pat, I'm going to call on you. Um, I think this is going to be a little bit unresolved yeah. uh, by the time it, it gets reviewed on Monday. So I think what we're working with right now is the principle that yeah. we want yeah. some kind of filter and exactly yeah. what that mechanism is, you know, we'll need a little more time to work that yeah. out. No, I would, I would agree. And we share that sentiment as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, Pat? You're muted. Jane, I agree with you. And I, I think Ben is right. I think what we're looking for is some filter, but but are the preservation um, uh, bylaw that we're looking at now also has to do with our recommendations for CPA funds and other things. And so it needs to be it needs to be uh, um, surpass, surpass the local districts in that we we weigh in on different aspects of the historic significance of properties, and so how we balance that um, and 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 account for it is is just you know I raise the question. Yep. I wonder if maybe the there could be some language in here that acknowledges that there are local historic districts uh, mm -hmm. and commission, a commission that um, regulates changes in those areas, just so it's, just so it's there and, and we're not m sort of misled by duplicative procedures. Right, but it doesn't mean that we wouldn't be the body that approves and recommends CPA funding for restoration. So, there's an overlap, but but we don't want it to be duplicative. 
Um, okay. So I'm aware of the time and don't want to keep those who need to need to go. So um, if that includes you, Ben, I'm happy to finish up the meeting if you need to. Okay. Um, yeah, I do need to run. Um, but uh, yeah, thanks all. I think uh, let me just I'm gonna I may have Jane to co-host, so I should be able to leave. <laughs> um, but yeah, thanks everyone. I think that basically did it for the agenda. If there's any, but if there's any other discussion items you wanted to hit on. Um, I guess the next meeting date, do we have that scheduled? I should I should before I go, I want to make sure I have that in my calendar. Um, I we've kind of been doing what the third. April 20th, we had that whole discussion last time about it. Okay, I do have that in my calendar. Okay, good. Yeah, I think we've all got it. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay, thanks. Um, so let's see, we could um, we could take on the February 16th meeting minutes to, to finish and then public comment. Um, Jane, I, I won't be able to come to the next meeting. Okay. I just want to do a heads up because okay. I want to make sure there's a quorum. Okay, thank you. I'll make a note of that. Um, all right. Um, have you had a chance to look at the meeting minutes? I have not. I'm sorry. Um, I have. Sorry? Oh, uh, I have. Yeah, okay. I guess. But I don't know. And I have as well. All right. I can just abstain. That's great. Okay. Um, do you want to, anybody want to make a motion about the meeting minutes from February 16th? I make a motion to approve the meeting minutes from February 16th. Okay. I second. Thank you. Um, uh, any discussion? So I've read them. I, they seem fine to me. Um, so um, let's have a show of hands for those who approve the meeting minutes. So that is six. Um, and any uh, against? Any abstentions? Thank you. Uh, okay. Then, um, so now we can um, take public comment if there are any participants uh, in the audience who wish to make a comment. Um, Hilda? A question, because I'm confused now that you went back to that section C. Does that mean only houses that are on mattress or are in local historic districts are prevented from demolition because most of North Amherst is not on mattress. Just no. for instance, I happen to know because I looked that up. But, but, but I mean, we've got all Putnam houses up here that are worthy of preservation, et cetera, et cetera. So I, 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 it wasn't clear to me that, that you were only preserving people houses that were on mattress or in a local historic district? Um, uh, does someone on the commission want to explain? Is it still everything over 50 years old gets looked at? Um, Jan, would you, would you like to explain? Yeah. Thank you. So the, the age, um, as well as whether it's uh, on a historic register or in a district, brings it before the commission. The, the only thing we were looking at in that paragraph was how to define the word demolition. It's not, it, it, it's not our process in that section C, it's just how demolition is defined for us. And it's either the entire thing, 25% of the facing facade or those elements. And we just have to figure out what triggers those elements being considered for the definition of demolition, not for coming before us for consideration in general for any changes. Does that make more yeah. sense? 
topics is that quickly that this public needs a lot of education on the importance of preservation. I think that's part of Robin's discussion of public benefit for tourism, if nothing else. You know, the, the economic life of the town depends. On, I mean, at the, you need you need to make a big deal of that because most people, a lot of people, listen to the town council meetings, but they don't have a clue about historic preservation. Well, we keep saying that as soon as this bylaw passes, because we've been working on this for so long. We just need it to pass. Then we want to do more outreach through articles, okay. newspaper, and things like that. But we can't really do anything until we get the but, but in terms of the CPA, they don't get it. So if you're going to talk about that issue, then you have to talk about in terms of public benefit, tourism, if nothing else. Okay. I've been Who's going to come to Emily Dickinson House if the house next door has gone to the pot or across the street? Mm -hmm. Anyway. Yeah, I made that. Somebody digs and you got to help the house okay. next door. But anyway, tourism is a big thing in Portion, so I just want to make that. Okay. Thank you for that comment, Hilda. Um, is there anyone else who wishes to make a public comment? Um, then. Uh, I don't know of any unanticipated items, um, so we can we can just move past that item, and we've already settled the next meeting date. So, oh, can I move to adjourn? Yes, you may. <laughs> I move to adjourn. Anybody want to? I'll second, second it. it. Everybody's <laughs> like, <"Yes." laughs> it's the most popular motion at every meeting. <laughs> All right. Well, you do it so nicely, Jan, and and the little dance between you and Jane is just adorable to watch. <laughs> <laughs> we got each other's back, don't we? Jane? Yeah, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all. Um, so we'll uh, see you again either I'll Monday. Most of you on Monday. Yeah. yeah, half of us will be there on Monday. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much. Bye, everybody. Bye. Good night, everybody.